Psalm 133. Give thanks to the Lord for his good, and his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim his mercy endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he's become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory in the tents of the righteous. In the right hand of the Lord is triumph, and the right hand of the Lord is exalted. In the right hand of the Lord is triumph. I shall not die, but I live, and I declare to the works of the Lord. The Lord has punished me sorely, but he did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter them. I will offer thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, who is righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you have answered me and become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and is marvelous in our eyes. And on this day the Lord has acted and we will rejoice and be glad in it. You know us so very well, Christ Jesus. You know our doubts and our questions, and you love us even enough to welcome such doubts and questions. You know our fractures and our divisions, and you love us enough to invite us to forgive one another and live in unity. You know the shadows that tempt us, and you still shine your light within us, inviting warmth and welcoming us back to your path of peace and love. Thank you for loving us and for inviting us on this journey of love. Help us embrace this journey that we may walk in the light and live in unity together. In your gracious love we pray. Amen.
Old Testament reading comes from Acts 4, 32 through 35, friends. Now the whole group of those who had believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power of the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses and sold them, and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it all to the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as many as they need. Friends, the gospel comes from John 20, 19 through 31. And it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house of the disciples had met were locked for the fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you give the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So when the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But when he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, I will put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side. I will not believe. And a week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And all the doors, the doors were shut. Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And then the Thomas said, he said, Put your finger here and see my, my hands, and reach out with your hand and put it in my side. And do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet to come to believe. Now these, Jesus did many signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing in him you may have life in his name. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. God is faithful in love and grace, making our confession welcome and cleansing for the soul. Rejoice! We are children of light, and even when we falter, God's love is strong enough to bring us back to the light of forgiveness and grace. Good morning. I'd like you to hang on to this thought as we move through our message this morning together, that the cleansing of the temple demonstrates that God can bring good from bad. Now, God is able to bring good out of bad. And friends, that really should cheer us up because we all do bad things in our life. And we suffer bad experiences. But God has the power to redeem the bad and cleanse us. And we see in our gospel lesson today that something bad had happened. And Caiaphas, the high priest, had quarreled with the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel. And Caiaphas report, rewarded his supporters in that conflict by allowing them to establish concession stands inside the temple. They were able to sell cattle and sheep and birds, and they exchanged all this for money. And everyone else had to set up booths across the way in the Kedron Valley. But those that had backed Caiaphas got prime real estate inside the temple walls. And the selling of animals and the changing of coins was necessary because people came from all over the place at Passover to make their sacrifices in the temple and to pay their temple tax. And the scriptures provide that only the best animals and those without blemish were accepted as sacrifices. So how could anyone bring top quality animal without a blemish, perfectly groomed from Galilee or Rome or Egypt? Well, they couldn't. Anyone who traveled across that vast area knows that at that time, that it would be muddy and dusty and just dirty. So they needed someone to set up shop and provide these, these acceptable animals. And these travelers were bring money from their own country and the countries to which they passed to get to Jerusalem. Now, if you've ever traveled, especially if you travel throughout Europe, you know that there's a time before the Euro that if you had a Deutsche Mark, you had to exchange it for a French franc or a British pound. And the exchange rates varied from place to place. So these travelers needed to exchange this mishmash of stuff that they had into acceptable 
coins for the temple tax. And they needed someone to set up money exchanges. They didn't need a marketplace inside the temple walls. I started this by saying that God can bring good from bad. And the bad was the marketplace was inside the temple walls. There had to be a marketplace somewhere, but it didn't really have to be in there. It would not have been there if it had been for Caiaphas and his political cronies. Payback, political exchange. We've witnessed the same thing in our very government today with the pork that's rolled into bills that are passed. And God was not well served by the crowding and the noise and the smell of the animals and inside the temple precinct. So Jesus came to the temple and he took out and he drove the cattle and the sheep out of the temple and he went through the area turning the tables over and he scattered the coins all over the place. And he yelled, don't make my father's house a marketplace. Now nobody knew this yet, but Jesus was the beloved son of his beloved father. He was not about to tolerate people setting up shop at his father's house, boarding animals at his father's property. And you could imagine the smell and the, and the, 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 the animals using the bathroom and the floor. Don't make my father's house a marketplace. It was disruptive. And I've always pictured Jesus herding four or five cattle and three or four sheep from the temple. But the scene must have been quite different because over 100,000 pilgrims had came to Jerusalem for the Passover. And they came to offer their sacrifices at the temple. At any given time, there would have been thousands of people inside these temple walls. There would have been a dozen or hundreds of vendors all hawking their prized cattle or sheep or birds for the coins. It had been much like a street fair or Oktoberfest in Nashville or something. Crowded, noisy, people bumping into each other and vendors crying out, buy here, buy here, and holding things up. Now you think about it, how would you like to have made a one-time pilgrimage to the temple to worship God? And you got to go through that kind of mess to get there. And Jesus didn't like it at all. He didn't just order them to get out. He drove them out. Then he scattered their tables and their money and, and their very dignity all over the floor. And I'd say the effect must have been just like a stick in the spokes of a chariot rolling through. So the marketplace in the temple was bad, but God brought good from the bad. And this incident in the temple gave Jesus the opportunity to introduce himself as God's son. And Jesus would have been in the new temple, the new place where people would come in the presence of God. Now, friends, we don't have to travel to Jerusalem to commune with God. We can commune with God wherever bread is broken and where will we drink in Christ's name. And our pilgrimage into God's presence needs not be a -a once-in-a-lifetime affair because we can enter into God's presence whenever we like because Jesus makes God accessible to us all the time, 24 hours a day. Friends, that's the good news, and it's the good news because we all have times when we're completely isolated and when we wonder where God is. And with the pain, it seems to be too great to bear. And the promise is that God is with us, even in the valley of the shadow of death. And the promise is God redeems us. The promise is that God brings good, even in the worst of situations. Y'all recall Terry Anderson? And he was captured by and made hostage by militants in Lebanon a long time ago. And they made him suffer for seven long years, and much of the time he spent in darkness and chains. And I remember sitting at the dinner table praying with my family about it. And he didn't know whether he would ever be free again. And he didn't know he'd ever be alive sometimes the next day or the next minute. But you know, God brought good from the bad. Before Anderson was captured, he wasn't a very nice man. He was imprisoned. It changed him, though. God was at work in his life and through his pain and after he was freed he reflected on his imprisonment and he said I almost chuckle sometimes this punishment if it really was seemed perfectly designed for my sins and weakness because I drank too much and there was no alcohol there and I chased women but there was no women there and I was arrogant and what better than to put me in the hands of these so arrogant and uncaring young men I've been careless with others' feelings, and these people didn't, they didn't give a tiny thought about me. I was agnostic most of my life, but my comfort here was my Bible, my prayers. Friends, let me drive that home because he said, I've been agnostic most of my life, and my only comfort was my Bible and my prayers. And it was in that terrible situation because of that 
horrible situation that God was able to break through the hardness of Terry's heart and in the depth of his despair. And he prayed, help me, God. Then there's no really reason why he should. But don't we always turn to you when we're in trouble? And we turn away from you when things are good. Now I'm doing it the same thing here, but you love me, so help me. And friends, God did help him. I don't know what kind of help Henderson had in his mind. Maybe he just wanted God to free him and, and get him out of that hell. But in a sense, that was what God did. God became very present for Terry Anderson in that dark cell. And God used that hellish situation to free Anderson from the sins and the compulsions that had enslaved him the majority of his life. And eventually God also freed Anderson from his imprisonment. And when he did, Anderson was a different person and he was a new man. He was redeemed. He was made whole and pure. And whether you're doing bad things or suffering through a bad experience, God will be there with you if you'll let him. God will help if you'll allow it. If you're doing something, ask for God's help. And when you do, be aware that asking God to redeem you from your sin is like asking a surgeon to save you from your cancer. God's cures are not always gentle. They can save your life. If you ask God to help you become a new person, don't be surprised if your cure involves pain. God, he loves to reprove us. And even Father, he reproves the Son. He delights. So don't expect God's remedy to be painless. But do expect that God will help and expect that God will redeem you. And when you're suffering through a bad experience, ask God for help. Ask the help that he might or might not be gentle, but the Lord will restore your soul. And this story of the cleansing of the temple is the first and the foremost, the assurance that Jesus is the temple, the place where we go to meet God, the one who brings us into God's presence, the one who restores our soul. It's the assurance that Jesus makes it possible to come into God's presence any time we want. Friends, there's no place on earth or under the earth, above the earth or out in the space where we're now traveling that God is not here with us. And the story of the cleansing of the temple is also the promise that Jesus provides what we need. He created us, he loves us, and he will redeem us. And the story, the assurance that nothing we have ever done is so bad that we're not beyond redemption, friends. So this morning, come to Jesus. Come and receive his blessing. Friends, I brought you this message in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, the disciples had gone into hiding in a locked room for fear of the Jews. They had good reason to be afraid. The Jewish leaders had persuaded Pilate to kill Jesus, and Jesus' disciples feared they're going to be next. And leaderless and despairing, the world had come crashing down around them on Friday with Jesus' death. Man, they believed him. They left home and hearth to follow him, and they'd stake their very lives on him, and man, he's dead now. And their lives are in shambles. And now on Sunday, they had heard reports that Jesus was alive, and Mary claimed to have seen him, to have talked to him. But you know how that goes. You can't believe everything you see and much less anything that you hear. And the disciples knew that Jesus had died. But they found it difficult to believe that he was alive. But time's going to tell. Discretion was the better part of valor. Better keep a low profile than to get caught in a dragnet. So the disciples were hiding in a locked room. <laughs> but Jesus came into the room. And his first word to them was peace. He said, peace be to you. And the disciples needed to hear that. They hadn't had a moment's peace since Jesus was arrested and seeing him in the flesh and hearing his peace must have really calmed them down. And then Jesus came into their marching orders. And he said to them, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And Jesus had work for them to do. And he gave them the power that they would need to carry out their mission. Receive the Holy Spirit. And by themselves, the disciples would be powerless. But they wouldn't be by themselves because God would be with them. But there was someone who was not with them. Thomas, one of the disciples. We know him as Doubting Thomas. Thomas wasn't with the disciples on Easter evening, so the disciples told him about Jesus. And when they did, he responded as much as, I'd say me and you would. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, sure you did. 
And after then, Thomas went into the step. And he told them he did not believe him. And he also told them he would require. Unless I see his hands, I ain't going to believe it. Unless I see the holes in his side, no way. Show me. I need to stick my fingers in the holes. Now, people don't talk that way unless they're angry. And I'd say Thomas had a reason to be angry because he'd been blindsided just like the rest of them. Man, he'd staked everything on Jesus. And he'd seen his hopes die. And the words let down probably don't even begin to describe how Thomas wiped out probably more like it. But a week later, Thomas was with the disciples when Jesus returned. And I wonder what was going on in that room. The rest of the disciples must have been upbeat and buoyant. And Thomas must have been sulking in the corner like an anchor dragging against the boat. The other disciples felt one way and Thomas, well, you know, he felt the other because he hadn't seen Jesus. And then Jesus came to him again and he said, peace be to you. And he went directly to Thomas, you know, doubting, angry Thomas. The show me the holes, Thomas. And listen to what Jesus did not say to Thomas. Jesus did not say, shame on you, Thomas. And he did not say, you aren't worthy to be my disciple. And man, he did not say, get out and don't come back. Instead, Jesus said, reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And don't be unbelieving, Thomas, but be believing. And Thomas has told the disciples what he needed to be able to believe, and Jesus gave it to him. Jesus met the conditions that Thomas had set because he helped Thomas to believe. But then he said to him, Because you've seen me, you believed. The blessed are those who have not seen and not believed. Man, I call this Jesus' last beatitude. Blessed are those who have not seen and not believed. It is Jesus' last because it comes at the end of his earthly ministry. I call it that because it's much in common with the ones of the, in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember, blessed are those poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are gentle. Each of us, <coughs> excuse me, each of them starts with the word blessing. And each beatitude turns to the world on its head. And we want to be rich. But Jesus blesses the poor. We want to be powerful, but Jesus blesses the meek and the gentle. And through it all, Jesus introduces a new world, the kingdom of God, a place where we live by God's rules. Then the kingdom is where Jesus calls us to be a new beginning. Right now, he calls us to become citizens of the new kingdom where we let God be our king. Friends, in our gospel lessons today, Jesus tells Thomas that he believed because he saw. Then he said, blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen but believed. We need to hear those words gladly, friends, because they apply to me and you because we have not seen the risen Christ. Christ in the flesh. But we believe and Jesus tells us that we're to be people of the special blessing. And God honors our belief. And God knows that it's easy to believe what we see and hard to believe what we cannot. So God gives us a special blessing for believing what we don't see. And for being willing to see, which is visible only through the eyes of faith. You know, Augustine put it this way. Understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you might believe, but believe that you may understand. Friends, life is hard. And it tempts us to hide up in a locked room, to stay in bed with the covers over our head, and run away from the challenge to say, Man, you know, preacher, I'll believe it when I see it. But Jesus challenges us to take this message of love into a world that desperately needs it, even if it will not welcome it, friends. Jesus challenges us to light, at least on a small candle scale, believing that darkness cannot overcome light, but that even the small light will overcome darkness. Jesus empowers us with God's Spirit so that the impossible becomes possible and the dream becomes reality. 
And Jesus blesses us with a walk in faith. Blessed are those who have not seen and believed. Friends, this is a blessing for us when life goes sour. It's a blessing for us when the times when everything seemed hopeless. Man, it's a blessing for us on those days that there seems to just be a way out. It's Jesus' last beatitude, his last blessing and his last promise. Blessed are those who have not seen but believed. Friends, believe it and receive Christ's blessing. I bring you this message in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of light and love, open our hearts to your message of unity. Open our minds to the light of your wisdom. Open our lives to the call of your spirit. Reveal to us your holy presence as we listen and learn this day. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. O holy and mighty God, with the apostles we live in the afterglow of the resurrection. And like them, we too have fears and doubts. We want to believe with all of our hearts the story we've heard. But so often daily life gets in the way of our faith. Father, help us. By the Holy Spirit, enable us to walk through each day's obstacles so that we may see them not as causes for doubt, 
but as barriers to be lifted by faith. O God of the risen Jesus, hear our prayer. God of our journey, we praise and thank you for gathering us to worship, discuss and decide and act together, give vision beyond our usual sight and give faith that is strong. O God of the risen Jesus, hear our prayer. And now as we pray together the prayer that he taught us so long ago, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Live in the light, the light of unity and love. Live in the light, the light of faith and hope. Live in the light, the light of God for all the world to know. And the church joined together and said, Amen. Thank you.